An intellectual carrot, the mind boggles. You see? You see? Your stupid minds. Stupid! Stupid! Earth has had Santa Claus long enough. We will bring him to Mars. I've been afraid a lot of times in my life. But I didn't know the real meaning of fear until... until I had kissed Becky. One thing will be clear. It's not for man to interfere in the ways of God. It's alive. Oh, it's alive. It's alive. It's alive. <laughs> Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Earth vs. Soup, episode 111. I'm Aaron Pallier. And I'm Darlene. Today's movie, as we have already discussed, is Attack of the Puppet People from 1958. The reason why we did this is because it's a double feature to a um, War of the Colossal Beast. So it's another Burt I. Gordon film. Okay, we've we have watched many Burt I. Gordon films in uh, earth versus soup now we've watched earth versus the spider <laughs> we've watched amazing colossal man we've watched war of the colossal beast we've watched now attack of the puppet people um i'm sure that there are more bert i gordon films that that we have actually watched i just don't remember them um off the top of my head uh is bert i gordon still alive yes yes he is at least according at the time of this writing so uh, man's done a lot all right so and done a lot that we really we haven't done, watched we haven't watched a lot of his stuff yes actually. but what we have watched we didn't think was the best the best or... sure <clears throat> sure but <clears throat> it's not some of his stuff is not awful like earth earth versus the spider is actually not bad that's not that bad anyway all right so have you seen this movie before, Darlene? No, I haven't. I have. And I didn't I didn't like it that much when I saw it. So I've probably avoided it um, since I was a kid. But because I, I, again, grew up watching Svengoolie and all that on WGN and watched a lot of these movies growing up. Um, so, yes, I have seen it. I remember a lot of the scenes from it. Uh the but premise is interesting. It's interesting. But it didn't do it well? I don't I don't know. I can't say that I, it didn't... I think the plot sucked. The plot sucked. The the concept is is interesting. The plot wasn't paced well. Let's put it that the film isn't paced well. Because it's kinda like, honey, I shrunk the kids. Sort of. Yeah, it is, sort of, but <clears throat> I don't know. I can't. I can't explain it very well. <coughs> Sorry for Darlene coughing again. Um, so this is a Burt I. Gordon produced, directed, and FX. The story by Burt I. Gordon. Um, I guess his wife helped do uh, helped do some of the special effects as well. That's okay. probably where it was done. Was, this, was were the special effects actually that bad? <clears throat> no, not not really. Considering what they were doing. Yeah, I mean, I could see, I could see problems with it. But I'm, I would not say that it was, it, it will fall into the category of did not work. I think it didn't, it didn't work, but it didn't not work. Um, but yeah, I, I, I've seen this before. Uh, any other thoughts before we get into the plot on this? Well, he, he puts his amazing Colossal Man in the movie. Yeah, yeah. We actually see Amazing <clears throat> Colossal Man on a drive-in movie theater. So the characters are watching another Bird Eye Gordon film. And I'm like, oh my god, it's gonna. There's gonna be like an, uh, a paradoxical regression through this movie of Bird Eye Gordon films, and it's it's gonna be terrible. Did but you say it was 1958? 1958. Mm -hmm. And we found it for free on YouTube. So feel free to watch this for free. Um, so the movie begins with a credit sequence where we see lots of people in tubes, and I'm not gonna make Earth uh, uh, um, this island Earth references about being in the tube, even though they do go into tubes to get high, basically. They get knocked out in tubes in this movie, basically. Anyway, anyway. Brownies have come to visit a business called Doll Incorporated. Brownies are uh, an, a, like a, a girls' it's scout a, group type it's thing. It's a younger girl scouts. Yeah, and they come to this... Because I was a brownie, and yeah. I was a girl scout. Okay. 
Um, and I said, oh, look, Darlene, and look, it's the young capitalists of America. <laughs> you know, you looked at me and I'm like, it's no, it's it's that's a reference to the Soviet young pioneers. Anyway, anyway, it was supposed to be a joke and you just kind of glared at me. And I'm like, All right. Anyway, well, it's because um, I used to be a brownie and that's just horrible. <laughs> <clears throat> Do Girl Scouts sell things for money? Yeah. All right. Anyway. I like Girl Are Scout those cookies. Real good Are girl they made from Girl, girl Scout? Uh, My them. lemonade is made from lemons. Yeah, that's right. So uh, a woman comes in to apply for a job at this point. She's met in the office by the owner who is in a lab coat. And this this guy, the owner is played by John Hoyt, who we know in so many things. John Hoyt is in a thousand different things. Um, he's the original chief medical officer on Enterprise under Captain Pike in Star Trek, but he's in so many pieces of science fiction that I cannot begin to mention. A lot of them. TV, though. A lot of TV. The guy yeah. the guy is a well-traveled man in entertainment circles. Um, he's in a lab coat. He treats dolls like friends. And it doesn't really seem like an innocent treating them like friends. Like he's doing it to play up to the girls. He's, he's also creepy. coming out creepy. He's creepy. So let's give him kudos because he is creepy. Yeah. So, uh, the and the woman, character is supposed to be creepy. The woman is named Sally Reynolds and she's played by June Kenny. And June Kenny has been in other Burt I. Gordon films like Earth versus the Spider. Um, but and she, she's coming into for employment. Yes. And there's this wonderful uh, e, uh, elevator scene. Well, that's later on. You're jumping ahead like four scenes. Oh. So yeah, she comes in and because Mr. France, the owner played by John Hoyt is being creepy, not like sinister creepy. He's just, we shouldn't say creepy. He's, he's coming across as weird is, is more of it. Right. Yeah. Just slightly like the actor is doing a good job with this. Yeah. Where you can't put your finger on what is wrong, but you wouldn't want to work for him. Or yes. have your kids around him. So she's like, yeah, I came in to, to work, but I don't know if this is the place for me. And he's like, no, no, no. I really need a, I need a, need somebody to, to help me. I'm, I'm lost without my assistance. I need somebody to answer the phone. The phone starts ringing. He convinces her to stay and take the job. Okay. And answer the phone. Yes. Um, she's like I said, she's a little creeped out, but she decides to stay. The old and secretary has disappeared. Yes, Janet Hall left last week and went to, and I can't, I didn't write, I didn't spell it right. I don't Passe. know. Passe? I don't know. She just went someplace. She went to another business, supposedly, to work. Um, the old secretary has disappeared. We see, we were introduced to John Agar, who plays a character named Bob Wesley. John Agar, again, has been in so many of the films that we have reviewed. I cannot begin to list them all, but if you don't know the name John Agar by episode 111 of Earth vs. Soup, you have not been listening. <laughs> John Agar is a king of the 1950s and 60s B-movie scene. Um, he is charming. He can be charming. He can also be incredibly off-putting as an actor. Um, but I'm, he's very typecast in this. Is he is, typecast? I don't know, darling. Because he... He's just supposed to be the charming man. Yeah, he's a and charming that's what lead. what he's, he's typecast as. He's the some... charming lead. Does he do a job with it, though? Yes. Okay. All right. <clears throat> then he's fine there. So he comes in, and he, I guess, is a... What the hell is he selling? He, he's like... He's a part of this doll-making industry. But what the hell is he selling? I don't know. Okay, he's selling something. Because there is a, the whole thing of... But that's a whole different person that sells the doll clothes. Yeah, there's a scene later on with salesmen selling doll clothes. And we, we learn that Mr. France isn't making doll clothes. He's making the dolls themselves. So, yeah, he's having to, like, buy doll clothes. Though he does seemingly make certain clothes himself. He just doesn't do a lot of them. And I guess his business is strong enough that he needs, like, lots of... He orders grosses. And you of, also have the little girl um, that's part of the brownies. That she comes by she all the time. She keeps coming around. 
because she abuses her dolls and like throws them into the road and they get broke and she brings them to him to fix. Yeah, that we learn all about that later on. So let's see here. Where am I in this plot? Right at the beginning, pretty much. Um, so Bob Wesley is a charmer. He comes in to talk to Mr. France. Uh, Sally's afraid of Mr. France, we learn at this point mm-hmm. because of yes. how weird he is. Um, and he talks to the dolls. We also learned that a mailman has disappeared and his mailbag is seen hanging in this back room. Okay. Yes, but that you missed the scene of the it, her being in the elevator, which you get uh, this. Uh, you get introduced to this male person that is taking delivering over. something for a, another person that disappeared. Yes, we learn. And about we a also lot of these have the the passe or whatever calls Doctor Franz, and. Um, Janet Hall never showed up. Yeah, the the disappeared former assistant. We also get that like um, Bob Wesley came on too hard to Sally right at the beginning, and he backs off and says, "I'm sorry, you know, I was being a little too forward. Let let's start again. You know, my name's Bob. You know, I I'm from St. Louis." etc etc and they get to know each other and in fact they do start falling for each other it does seem a little quick but but it's bob bit, is charming they've said it's six weeks later oh yeah when i mean they there go are, to there is the, time, yeah. the theater uh the and drive-in. see the, the drive-in and see the amazing yeah, colossal because man. my next notes are like sally and bob are at a drive-in watching amazing colossal man he proposes to sally and i'm like oh wait a second and then you're like no 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 it's been weeks remember they just said this and i'm like oh, you're right you're right. It has been weeks. I, he, uh, for whatever reason, I didn't pick up on that immediately, but it was. You're right. And um, he he says, "Let's go to Las Vegas. Let's get let's get married in Vegas tomorrow. Let's let, let's just go." And she seemed she seemed a little hesitant at first, but then really warmed to it quickly. Like, okay. And you come to St. Louis with, uh, you know, and you'll be Mrs. Bob Wesley. And, and what she asked, what do I do? And she goes, you, uh, you're going to be a wife. Yeah. <sighs> but I mean, she didn't seem like, all right. I, I, one of the films that we've watched with John Agar in it, he remember there was, there was a one that he got really chauvinistic with. And I can't remember what it was. His character was really, a, really a chauvinist. But, and it's the same sort of thing here, except the difference is, is that in the movie that I can't remember the name of, the woman was like a scientist. She was a career woman, and making that kind of suggestion to her was kind of offensive. Mm-hmm. But here, Sally was coming across as, "Look, I'm only taking this job to pay for rent. I want to be a housewife." I don't think she came out and said that, but she didn't seemingly have any problems with that idea. She's like, no, okay, that's no, fine. she was fine with it. She, and she was, was very still, happy after she thought about it. It was still a bit chauvinistic to assume that on his part, like, oh, you're, you'll just be a housewife and, and be home with the kids. I think that that is a little still but a little it's chauvinistic. 1958. It's 1958. I, I, I don't want to make excuses for that, but I'm just saying today that sort of behavior well that sort of behavior would be, sla- or, well, you'd sla- be that slapless. sort of assumption we should say not behavior but that sort of assumption that oh wouldn't, no you'll just it wouldn't it actually go crossed in the man's mind today no, anyway it, w- it wouldn't like when we got married did i just think oh automatically you're gonna quit your job and stay at home and be barefoot mm-hmm. in the kitchen no of course not <laughs> yeah it's insane that's insane right <laughs> everyone's people uh, but anyway, that my mind went to that. I was like, oh, well, is she going to say something about that? Like, is she going to want to work still? I mean, it is 1958, and it is sort of accepted that the woman, a wife, isn't going to work outside of the home. That doesn't really... I mean, obviously, during the 1940s, it was different. And he has a business, so if she wanted to put her around doing secretarial work or something she could she could i don't know what his business is though it's we it's don't know Louis. what is it, it has something to do with the doll industry maybe he's he's like maybe petrochemical he's, he's making plastics maybe what, maybe he's a seller too i don't know like a middleman a, distri- a distributor we don't know we, 
at least at least we don't remember from the film. Let's put it that way. It could have been mentioned and we just didn't catch it. Um, so the next day comes and Mr. Franz Call calls Sally. Call Sally because Sally was going to wait for Bob at her place and he hasn't come to pick her up. And Bob said he would talk to Mr. Franz about not being in. Not being in. Because he has to and, go and talk to him about whatever. Right. And Mr. Franz says, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Bob Wesley was here, but he didn't say anything about going to Las Vegas. He, he he went back to St. Louis. And she's crushed. She's crushed. She thinks that he just kind of let her on and But when she her. comes in, she sees a doll that, that looks, that looks like Bob exactly Wesley. like Bob Wesley. Wesley. Okay. Is it so, Wesley? Yeah, it's Bob Wesley. So Sally knocks the the lock off this glass cage contain, containing these like special dolls that Mr. France doesn't allow anyone to, to deal with. Um, and she's like looking at this doll of Bob Wesley and she's just like shocked at how good it is. And then Sally goes to see a detective. She says that Mr. France has turned people into dolls. She kind of comes to this conclusion. It's really strange because Hey, there's this like mailman that's in in these special dolls. Um, but she convinces the police by tell, uh, going, "Well, this person, you know." And then there was this mailman that, that disappeared. disappeared, and he goes, "Oh, that's what his name was." And she get that name from the elevator scene. Yeah, and then there was like a, a girl that disappeared. Her name was Lori, and and she disappeared in this building or something like that. And so the detective's like, fine, fine. I guess that's enough to go on to for me to think that maybe you're on to something. I don't believe this doll shit. No, but, he doesn't. But I'll go and we'll talk to Mr. Franz. So they go and talk to Mr. Franz. And Mr. Franz is completely open about everything. He's like, no, no, no. These are these are dolls. Look, you know, he takes it out of the out of the case. He's like, I make dolls of people that and burns are, it. Yeah. He burns this doll, but he says, I make dolls out of people. Uh, well, I make dolls of people that I am close to because I don't like them being gone. I like to have some, uh, something to remind me of them. Like, and all right. So anyway, uh, he burns it and says, look, no, they're, they're just dolls. And so the detective's like, okay, lady, you're crazy. I'm out of here. So we then have like, uh, the detective leaves. Sally tries to leave, but is stopped by Mr. France. And there's like this high pitched whining sound and a flash, a flash. And she's like a foot tall with no clothes on uh, with a napkin on. Yeah. With a napkin. She just has, I gotta say that was pretty good because they made the initial. So it turns out that yes, Mr. France has been making people into doll sized people. He brings in Bob in a tube and like knocks him out. He, he like pours him out of the, well, he opens up the tube so, so she can drag him out, drag him out. And he, he basically explains that he projects people to any size that he chooses by converting matter into light through high frequency vibration. There's this crazy sci-fi explanation, but basically he's and invented he makes Tom, what? the cat into Tiny a doll sized cat yeah which comes in play with the kid yes the, the girl so basically what dr france has effectively made is a transporter that's basically a transformer that sizes people yeah but you could them. also you could you wouldn't have to resize people with it you could literally just move them with it at the same size like it's the it's how he focuses it like he has built a transporter because they move from one table to the other when they get moved in size. So, holy crap, right? And I, I guess it implies that the matter is reorganized by this device, which means that all the mass of the people should still be there, even though they're a foot tall. But we see that's not the case because he's able to pick them up just fine. So where did all that mass go? I don't know. Anyway, it, the, the, okay, he, he has made a magic transporter. Just go with it. Um, and he has also invented a drug. This is a doll maker, by the way. He's also invented a drug that puts people into suspended animation. So these tubes that he keeps everybody in, he puts a like a, a knockout drug in it, and it pauses everybody. 
Yeah, my thought on this one at this point was, my God, we could go to um, outer space and we wouldn't have a problem with weight or... Yes, I assume that there's a problem with range on his transporter, but he's invented effectively no, a suspended animation it, drug. Yeah, You could put him in the tubes, humans, cows, cats, you know, whatever, and have... A yeah, smaller, a, col- a colony ship uh, oh, the size of a car. Ye- well, probably bigger than that. And but... then everybody gets resized at the at the end. Yeah, and all you'd have to have is one or two people running. Not even that. You just put them on a ballistic trajectory. Like, yeah, this this guy, this doll maker, has effectively solved colonization of space. Yes, and <laughs> that's what I said to him. And it's... <laughs> so yeah, I I mean, obviously, I remember this from from being a kid, and I didn't really. Because I didn't like the. So film. in my head, there's this whole <laughs> other. <laughs> like this guy, this guy has solved like the world's problem. Hunger problem. Hunger too. problem. Because you can just, again, it's a honey I shrunk the kids thing, where at the end of the first honey I shrunk the kids, they like make a, a Thanksgiving dinner with like a huge turkey. Yeah, I've I've solved world hunger, but this is 1958. He's solved world hunger, but he's not. He hasn't put two and two together. He's made like two miracle inventions. Well, that's because he's a lonely person and he talks to his dolls. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to just go <clears> through <throat> the rest of the plot because I have a paragraph on the rest of the plot. That's how much I kind of disdain this movie. Um, he lets them have parties. Yes. He, he has does. like half. A, he has like a dozen people in two, but I, we I meet only like thing. five or six. You. Yeah. You meet the military. The the marine. There's like two the, girls. The girl that sings. The slutty girl. I don't know who she is. I don't know. <clears throat> who doesn't even seem to care about what's happening. She's like, yeah, he takes care of me. And then Bob and... No, and there's one other guy. I think he might have been the mailman. I don't know. I don't know. Point is, um, Dr. Franz uh, has has par- lets these people have parties with like a record player. They're trying to call the police. The police can't hear them on the phone because they're too small. Even though they're able to, they get make the, this Lori sing, and that was off-putting oh, God, because yeah. it really didn't. She didn't even. It's a song. It's a song about being a little dolly, and it's oh God. But oh, Franz also and has it's so bad lip synced. Um, Franz also has a friend named Emil who is a marion uh, marionettist. Yes, and he has like these special marionettes that are from like Hungary. Um, they talk about their time in Europe, uh, clearly before the war, where they traveled around doing shows together with these like marionettes and pup and like that do- Mr. France is like the only guy that can fix these things. Um, then it turns out that there's uh, once once Bob has disappeared and Sally has disappeared, the cops get suspicious again of Mr. Franz. They start investigating and Mr. Franz decides that he needs to just come clean with all of this. But instead of coming clean to the cops and saving everybody, he decides that he needs to kill himself and all of his dolls. So they can all be together forever. And then there's that scene with a little girl with the cat in from the matchbox. Yeah. And the detective sees that and gets really kind of weird because the brownie the brownie girl she's just like yeah he lets me play with his dolls and they talk and and there's this tiny little cat that he lets me play with that he keeps in a matchbox and the detective's like oh shit oh shit this is pretty effed up um and then so doc, uh, mr franz takes all his, of his shrunken people to the theater for a theater party as a going away present and they're performing he's like performing a really twisted dumb version of Jekyll and Hyde with it. Yes. And they decide that they're like going to... Like if you to... only knew the premise of Jekyll and Hyde. So... And tried to create a plot with it. <sighs> and make Sally talk to Jekyll, Dr. Hyde? Yeah, I, I don't know. So they, they come up with this plan to put one of the knockout drugs that, they, that Mr. France puts into the tubes into, into his, his coffee. coffee to knock him out so they can all run back to the laboratory and use the equipment to return to normal size. Okay, total. Okay, I get it. I get it. So they they through a convoluted series of, of stunts, they're able to drug his coffee. Does that matter? No. Mm, no. Because it doesn't knock him out. It doesn't even slow him down. 
Okay. But they nothing happens. But they uh, Sally and Bob escape somehow. Everyone escapes. Where'd the others go? Who knows? They're never talked about. And then they go to the and I, get get into a box. Well, see, here, here's the thing. Bob, <clears throat> Bob, and Sally. They, they get separated from everybody else. We don't know what happened to everybody else, but Bob says, if we can get back to the lab, we can return to normal size and we can help them all because we can just punch out Mr. Franz and then collect everybody and return everybody else to normal size. And I'm like, okay, that's again, a reasonable plot. Yeah, plot. So they're not like tiny, honey, we shrunk the kids, like tiny, tiny. They're like a foot tall. And they have to run a mile back to this lab, which yes. takes a long time for them. And they're able to hide in a box because a dog is like chasing them. They hide in a box. It gets delivered into the lab. They go in. They return to normal size. Mr. Franz comes in and is shocked to see them at back at normal size. And I guess it doesn't work it's on the... their clothes. Because they have to get their old clothes out of the closet. I, I, I don't get that. I don't get that either. That doesn't make sense with what Mr. Fran says earlier. And he's like, don't leave me. Don't leave me. This is Mr. Fran saying it. Don't leave me. Don't leave me. And they like push past him and leave. And he's lonely, dejected looking in his lab, whimpering about being lonely. The end. Yeah. It doesn't even come back in with the police and the child of the kid and all the other. People. So. So it leaves you like what? I need I need to say. I need to say like right off that this might be the most competent and well-written of Bird Eye Gordon's movies that we've watched besides Earth versus the Spider. I actually really liked Earth versus the Spider. But this is far better than Amazing Colossal Man. This is far better than War of the Colossal Beasts. Is this a good movie though? Mm. Even before we get into what worked and what didn't no. work. I don't think this is a good movie. And it's I... mainly because the only the, the main plot of this is so ludicrous and, and, and nonsensical that it the movie kind of falls apart. The premise is fine, but when the characters that are like inside this trauma, they're able to like make reasonable plans and they seemingly work only because of coincidence. Like, hey, look, we, we came up with this plan to knock out France so we can get back to the to the um, lab. And it, it just doesn't work, but they still are able to escape and get back to the lab. And they're prevented by racing cars, except they're not prevented by racing cars because they're just able to dodge out of the way easily. They're prevented by a dog, but they just hide from the dog in a box. Like, there's seemingly stakes put up all the time of like, hey, here's these difficulties that you're going to encounter to get past this guy, right? But none of it really matters. They're just able to easily breeze it, past it. It makes me feel like a 10 year old on the consequence. And, uh, you know, like you're reading one of the young books uh, or a young kid's um, show where the consequences don't really, there isn't thought out on how it gets resolved. No, and, and ending before we find out the resolution for all the other people that were involved in this, I think that's a little upsetting. Like, I would have liked to have seen everybody at the end, like France in handcuffs or something like that. Yeah, with the rest of the people um, having to be um, raised up. But there's then it could go to, you know, what can this, this thing be used for? Yeah, no, I mean, the consequences of this device is far more interesting than what's in this movie. Now, let, let's go Let's go back and go, what worked in this movie? What worked? Did anything really truly work? Well, sometimes the settings with the... I was impressed about the settings sometimes with the size yeah, yeah, the the oversized things that they had built on set for the characters to interact with. Yeah, um, supposedly the giant telephone was actually the phone company's giant telephone that they had actually just had for a joke or something like that. Somebody had built a giant telephone for the phone company, and they just used that on set. Okay, great. 
it, it looked <laughs> fine. It worked. It was a rotary phone that actually worked. Like, cool. All right. Running up a, a leg of a a table or chair would not have worked because it's slippery and polished and whatever. And the guy did it easily. Yeah. Um, I could see using the cord for the phone to go down under the ground. <clears throat> um, some of the stuff made sense. Some of it didn't. Looking through a keyhole... Okay, I can see I that, that in that yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, but like truly worked. Okay, so some of the props that are on the set. I uh, don't think I don't think any of the acting rises to the point of me saying the doll dress works. versus the dress that she wears is two different things. Yeah, they're, they're well that's the thing. They're supposed to all be wearing like doll clothing. And if you know what we're talking about, doll clothing is not as comfortable one well it wouldn't be as comfortable it wouldn't be as well made it would be a little clumsy you know what i mean like and none of it looks clumsy it all looks like there's tiny buttons and like properly sized tiny buttons that would be far too tiny for people to actually sew um the shoes are fine they fit fine like when you think about that that just kind of breaks down like the concept of the movie is good so we'll say that works like the the, the, the whole premise fine i i will say some of the props worked i liked the machine that he uses i think that was a cool looking prop too i think john hoyt as mr franz is probably the only properly good performance in this movie and that's saying something with john agar because you i, I generally like... like john agar even <clears throat> though he can be terrible when he just doesn't care about the material um, but, he didn't give it his all with the charisma that he could have done with between the two characters as a love interest. Yeah. It didn't come off as. No, it didn't. It didn't. But what, what truly doesn't work about this movie? The execution of the plot. The execution of it all doesn't work. I don't like how. I don't like the side characters in this at all. I don't think any of the side characters truly work, even though I think the acting is okay. I wouldn't say it works with what they're given. I think the acting is fine, but none of the side characters are characters. They're just kind of there to be props for Bob and Sally. Really? It's, it's the Bob and Sally movie. It could have been entirely the Bob and Sally movie with nobody else in it. But then and, it would and, be and horrible, horrible. Would it be horrible? Uh, what do the other did... characters bring? Well, what I'm saying is... The other is shrunken characters, I should say. People to do the work that they needed to do. The dropping the drugs into the thing. <sighs> Why? But uh... that didn't matter in the end. Like, yeah, the, the whole lookout scene. The lookout scene, fine. There, there probably should have been, like, one other person. But... Yeah, and... It would have been interesting the paper plate, uh, the paper plane that Air, they made. Yeah, they made a paper plane that says like "Help us" on it, and it just doesn't go out the window. It's like uh, goes into the trash can. Yeah, it it could have went into a a a, a, a um into a garbage guy picking it up and just throwing it away or something. Or like that. in in seeing it and going, "What the hell." And maybe the police officer. I was like, this could have went somewhere. There's a lot of things in this movie that could have gone somewhere, but and I think don't. that is what the problem with the execution is. There was so much stuff that could have happened, it just and didn't. it didn't, and things got solved with no connection. Yeah. So that's what didn't work. So, in that sense. That is what I would explain to uh, people that want to see this movie to do media is watch this so you don't do that. Where you have this really cool concept that clearly has ramifications that are that are giant, right? Like and, they're, that are amazing. They're world shattering like ramifications. But why did this guy, how did this guy ever design this thing? He's a doll maker. And he's literally designed not only something that can solve world hunger or make space travel possible, easily like, possible. Um, 
he's also made like a suspended animation drug. Which could help on on surgeries. It could help on surgeries. It could help in space travel. It could do, I mean, all these things. And yet he, he's just like a doll maker. He tries to make an explanation for it. Oh, I, I, I studied like harmonics and, and crystals. And I, I saw like how I can project things through crystals to make them larger or smaller. And I just disintegrate people to recombine them into smaller or larger. So it's like, okay, dude, this is like a, it's a transporter. Like I said earlier, you've made a transporter. Holy crap. What I mean, this is way beyond what you're talking about. And maybe that's not what they intended in the film. No, I don't think that's what they intended to do. It clearly moves people. It clearly changes mass. Large amounts of mass. And we're not seeing like splattered gore everywhere of whatever is left over from people. You know, like. I, I don't know. It's this is what bothers me about the movie. There's so many things in it that could be really interesting to explore with this. And generally, most movies that deal with this sort of idea, including Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, completely drops the ball. Like it, it drops the ball in the sci-fi aspect of this. But Honey, the Sh- I Shrunk the Kids was a comedy, not a science fiction movie. Yeah, and this is supposed to be like science fiction. Is this supposed horror? to be horror? Not really. It's not horror. It doesn't go- come off as horror, but if somebody my can shriek you... My heart's not in this movie. Well, and it, it can clearly yeah. enlarge things, too. And because they go back to normal. Yes. So you could you could build you could build a, let's say... A 10-inch ro- a rocket. And then and... enlarge it up to, like, 5,000 feet tall. and Or, hey, look, here, here's a tiny little bit of uranium. I'm just going to enlarge it to be 60,000 tons of uranium. I mean, the man's like completely broken the economy too, because what, what it does, as we've seen, mass is just created out of nothing and out of energy. And in it's, it is destroyed. And another well. thing that should have come up is this amount of electricity that he uses at, when he u- uses that device should have been showing on the, it would have been a great thing to be the, police officer and like the whole city blacks out when he's doing something even small like, and the perspective of the police officer would have been crazy so uh, i'm not recommending this film but it's a light not recommendation because i think it might be one of his more competent films bird eye gordon's films but it's just so kind of eh. and i would say this is it has so much potential to to play with something and get results, but it's done in a child format where everything solves itself. Sort of. I mean, John Hoyt is so Mr. France. So this is one of those things that you need as a writer or a a a movie thing. This would be a good thing for you to watch and go, well, oh, they made a mistake here, and they could have done gone this way, or they, did, you know. Like I said, the uh, being a police officer investigating this thing could have been a just a Mister Mister France. I think might be the only reason to really watch this film, and he's just a very strange villain because he's not. He is a villain. He's kidnapping people. He's effectively torturing them. He's um, manipulating them. He's he's clearly an evil person. But he's so mild mannered and kind at the same time Mm -hmm. that it's just, it's weird. It it really is weird. He's pity. He's pitying. Like you want to pity him as well. You do. He's just so, I I mean, I don't like that. I don't like that because he's clearly an evil SOB for doing everything. This is why I said that kind of of a character would have been what you should have done for Damien the uh, devil's child I don't instead know, of man. just the hack and slash thing. So yeah, my heart's not in this movie because I just think there's so many <sighs> weird choices with it. There's just so many weird choices with it. It could have went in so many different directions. Like yet. why is, why is he also producing like mass producing copies of them 
when they're shrunk and how is he doing it because they're perfect copies they look exactly like the real people yeah that was shown in when he brought out dave wesley the dow bob bob wesley bob, bob wesley because he dow. has like multiple versions of them so how, is he here's here's here is this thing duplicating them as well i don't know aaron and he has like dozens of bob wesley's Let, and tubes that are knocked out hey, like it did do the science fiction thing of making you think about shit yes but that's why i'm saying i don't recommend it but it's a light not recommendation because i'm thinking about the ramifications of the things that we do see in this movie more than the actual movie yes the movie failed the movie the movie by itself failed the idea is interesting but just wasn't done well so i don't know i don't want to harp on it anymore because my like i I keep saying my heart's just not in this movie it's not i'm not thrilled with it it's just very disappointing so i'm i'm gonna fit sit on this one too because... well no no i mean that's not fence sitting i'm not recommending it i'm saying i don't recommend this movie but it's a light not recommendation for the for just the reason of, of john hoyt is fantastic as mr france and the idea that it has in it is fine it, it made me think so don't fence it are you recommending it or not I want to say recommendation with a light one. A light. So you're giving a light recommendation. Yeah. Only because of the concept? The concept, the thought, the thought provocation it does. Uh, also really showing where something should work, but doesn't. So I guess between both of us, we're just kind of putting up, if you take the average of both of us, it's us putting our hands in the air going, eh. Uh, yes. Like, Yeah, so I'm Aaron. I'm Darlene. Good night. And keep watching the skies. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Thanks for listening to this episode of This Week in Geek. Hungry for more? Check out our website at thisweekingeek.net. You can subscribe to the podcast, browse our Twitter and Instagram, and leave your thoughts on today's topics. If you'd like to give us some feedback, send us an email at feedback at thisweekingeek.net. Tune in next time, and remember, lower your shields and surrender your listenership. We would be honored if you would join us. Thank you for your cooperation. Good night.